Okay, is, yeah, we're good. Um, th thank you, Jeff, and uh, Ohio State for hosting this. It's another remarkable conference, and it's sort of overwhelming to see so many old friends and allies in the audience um, and to get a chance to catch up with people who don't come here often enough from South Africa and other countries. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is, uh, yeah, quality of calories. The, um, the past year, I've had a couple, few interesting experiences that have had me kind of thinking about the conflict that confronts us and why we have such, you know, the battle we're fighting, the challenge we're confronted with. So the two things, um, last fall, summer and fall for my book, I interviewed 100 plus physicians and dietitians and chiropractors and dentists and psychiatrists who have sort of converted, for lack of a better word, and are um, now prescribing low-carb, high-fat diets to their patients. And I wanted to understand their challenge and the challenge of their patients, and quite a few of you in the audience today. And I'm going to talk about some of the lessons I learned from the few physicians, and I will show your names. So I apologize if I'm exposing your secrets. Um, and then also, you may have noticed the British Medical Journal, along with Swiss Re, which is the world's largest uh, um, uh, reinsurance company. I didn't even know what reinsurance companies were until this happened, but reinsurance companies insure insurance companies. So these are companies that stand to make money if insurance companies lower their payouts so they have a real vested interest in making people healthier. And so Swiss Re and the BMJ bonded together to uh, Swiss Re financed a nutrition policy series that was published in the British Medical Journal. And the goal of these articles was to get authors with disparate perspectives on the same papers and then have us basically fight it out for a year until the paper was deemed ready for submission. And then you could see what kind of, I don't know if we'd call it a compromise or a, you know, cis, kind of like World War I, what trenches we ended up digging. and. Um, uh, so these articles came out in June, and with the articles, they had a conference in Zurich, and they invited us all to Zurich, and they had presentations of the articles. And it was a, it was a real step forward in the sense that those of us from our side of this divide had got to have a seat at the table in a conference. It was the first time there was a conference where both sides were represented. And they had to hear us, which was interesting. And the BMJ, for lack of a better word, is low-carb or carb-restriction friendly. So they're behind this, but they have to do it very politically, and they have to do it slowly. So this was a first step along the way. We'll see what happens, how it goes from there. So I'm going to talk about some of the revelations I had dealing with both the conversations with the physicians and um, the BMJ conference. And my disclosures, I get book royalties, I get honorariums to give talks. Um, CrossFit, bless their hearts, bless Greg Glassman's heart, is supporting me nowadays. So. I was complaining about having to pay my own health insurance and how expensive it is for a family of four, and now I don't. Um, thank you. So let's go back. Uh, one of the questions I always get is, you know, are we making progress? It's very easy, uh, despite wonderful conferences like this, to think that, you know, to, to see the day-by-day -day, uh, news cycle, which I'll talk about because there was new news today. But let's, when I go back to where we were 20 years ago, so I first got into this, my first article on the obesity epidemic was for science in 1998. That's when a very esteemed researcher at Columbia University told me that if we all ro still rolled down our car windows, we'd be a pound or two lighter. And I thought, he's out of his mind. There's something wrong with this science. So 20 years ago, there's maybe a dozen physicians in the whole US prescribing low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic diets. Um, half of them had written diet books. That may be slightly off, because Mike Eads told me recently that when they wrote Protein Power, which was around 1993, they used to get letters from physicians saying, I give your book to patients. So I may be underestimating that. But if so, I don't know where those physicians went by the time I started researching this field in 2000. And the interesting thing is when I was doing my research for my first New York Times Magazine article and then my book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, I talked to all the authorities in the field, and a lot of them knew that Atkins was a terrific way to lose weight and used it themselves. So Jerry Reven, for instance, the 
you know, the, without whom the concept of insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome wouldn't be where it is today, told me that he personally uses the Atkins diet to lose weight, but that's not the issue. And the issue, of course, was LDL cholesterol and saturated fat, and so they wouldn't prescribe it to their patients. Um, J.P. Flat at uh, uh, UMass Worcester is one of the drivers of the idea that low-fat diets should lead to weight loss because of its thermodynamic ideas told me, yeah, sure, Atkins diet's a terrific way. And, and the low-fat, fat, low fat calorie-restricted diet was dogma. So that's what you did. The idea was carbohydrate-restricted diets would kill us because they were high in fat, and if you wanted to lose weight, you had to restrict calories, and you ate a low-fat diet because that helped you restrict calories. So in 1998, it's interesting, Malcolm Gladwell did an article for the uh, New Yorker, probably the first magazine article ever done on the obesity epidemic. I mean, really comprehensive piece, as typical of Malcolm. It was very thoughtful and also kind of typical. It was not exactly right. Um, <laughs> He said this, and it's not his fault, it's fascinating. I mean, it's just, he read the wrong books, he talked to the wrong people, he came to the wrong conclusions. But his interest, he said, we've been told that we mustn't take in more calories than we burn, that we cannot lose weight if we don't exercise consistently, that few of us are able to actually follow this advice as either our fault or the fault of the advice. Medical orthodoxy naturally leads towards the former position. Diet books tend towards the latter. Given how often the medical orthodoxy has been wrong in the past, that position is not on its face irrational, and it's worth finding out whether it's true. I mean, he completely nailed it. And then, of course, the problem is he sides with the medical orthodoxy, and in part because he reads a few diet books that really read like they're selling snake oil. And he decides we're all selling snake oil. And he goes through and he defines, he, he realizes that diet books have a certain methodology that they all follow. And he calls it one part of this methodology is the conversion narrative. And he says Atkins is a conversion narrative at its finest. Dr. Atkins, a humble corporate physician, is fat. He begins searching for answers. He tests unorthodox views. As if by magic, he loses weight. How many people in the audience have experienced that out of curiosity? OK. Um, he tests his unorthodox views on patients as if by magic they lose weight. Incredibly, he has come up with a diet that produces steady weight loss while setting no limit on the amount of food you can eat. And inspired by this, he writes his book, and the implication is this is all crap, and he's doing it to make money. And one of the revelations I had talking to physicians is this is basically how science progresses. So if you're lean and your patients are lean, you have no reason to question the conventional wisdom, right? It's working for everyone you're around you. It's working for yourself. It's working for your patients. If you're lean and your patients are not, and you're telling them to eat less and exercise more and eat healthy, you're either going to decide that they're not following your advice, which is the conventional wisdom. Nobody follows a diet. It's very hard to imagine that the advice doesn't work because it works for you. And Context, perspective is everything. In this uh, uh, book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow by Kahneman, the uh, uh, economic psychologist, behavioral psychologist, he has a concept he calls uh, what you see is all there is. Why see at he? And it's really, it's a, it's a dominant way to think. It's a very powerful way to think about the world. That what you see is all there is. I mean, the, the, our critics would say what I see is a room full of people who believe what I believe, therefore I believe we should all believe what I believe, but I'm not seeing the people outside the room who think we're all quacks. Um, if you're lean, you don't question the conventional wisdom. Works for you if you're patient. So if you're fat and getting fatter, then you question the conventional wisdom. Some huge proportion of the physicians who have converted to our way of thinking have done so not just because their patients were fat and their waiting rooms are getting fuller of obese and overweight diabetic individuals, as every waiting room in the country and the world has been, but because they themselves were getting heavier, and so they could say to themselves, as Sue Wolver, bless her heart, put it, maybe it's not that my patients are not taking my advice, maybe my advice stinks. So they're asking the same question that Gladwell was asking, but nowadays the internet allows you to bypass the medical orthodoxy and to experiment. So, we're now 2018. I'm estimating that there are probably 10,000 to several tens of thousands of physicians in the world who have converted, OK? It's hard to tell. Like when I get an email saying, I'm an MD, I read your book, I, sh 
I shifted and I lost weight. Is that the only doctor? Every doctor who reads my book and said, do they email me? Is it one in 10? Is it one in 100? Are you know, these conferences, there's 300, 600, you probably could have gotten 600 people, but is that the only 600 physicians in the US? Or is it only one of 10 are actually paying attention? As a test case, the Canadian Women Physicians Low Carb High Fat Network as of July had 3,300 members. Thank you. And it was going up by, you know, roughly, again, 80 in the past month, and that was, what, 4% of the Canadian physician community between this and another group. So if it's 4% of the American physician community, it's 40,000 physicians in the U.S. I don't believe that number. But again, it's probably, you know, one-fourth of that or maybe half of that. There's a, and that would be the U.S. alone. So we've had this huge shift. But the interesting is the conventional wisdom is still these diets are deadly. Okay, so U.S. News and World Reports does their annual diet ranking. Uh, you know, DASH is still the best, followed by the Mediterranean diet. I don't even know what the flexitarian diet is, which shows how ignorant I am. Um, paleo comes in at 32nd, tied right behind the acid alkaline diet and tied with the raw food diet. And then the bottom, you know, 40 is Atkins, Ducan, and a ketogenic diet. So the diet that we believe is the healthiest possible diet you could put your patients on. And so I, I'm trying to understand that. I mean, I know on one level, this is put together by, they get a committee of establishment nutritionists and uh, well-respected nutritionists and researchers and people who rise to the top in the establishment become well-respected, believe what the establishment believes. So it's kind of a classic groupthink phenomena. But um, there's got to be something else going on as well. The interesting thing is the debates in the media, so if you think back 20 years, the idea was a low-carb diet will kill you, as it was 20 years before that, and we should all eat a low-fat, calorie-restricted diet. The debates in the media now in the blogosphere are often about not whether low-carb will kill you, but about whether low-fat is as good as low-carb, which is fascinating. So when they tell us we're wrong, it's because low-fat is just as good as low-carb. When we have to say, but wait, 20 years ago, you were saying low-carb would kill you and didn't do anything and would make you fatter. Now, you know. So the goalposts have changed in a good way. Um, this is an article in the New York, um, New York Magazine that was co-authored by my friends Mark Bittman and David Katz, both proponents of vegetarian vegan diets. And it's interesting. It was a Q&A about how to eat right and the questions were, if there's one thing I know for sure, it's that carbs are evil. You know, no, they're not. Yeah, but carbs are evil. Now, they're sure, but I should still avoid carbs, right? Why have I been led to believe that carbs are evil? So the message is out there. I was saying I was going through, uh, going to Zurich, I went through customs. And when you go through customs, you show me your passport. They say, what are you doing here? I say, I'm here for a conference. What's a conference on? What are you doing at the conference? I'm talking. What are you talking on? Obesity. And the Swiss customs agent looks down in his belly and says, I should give up carbohydrates, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I don't know if it's changed everywhere. I don't know if we go to the, you know, the Mississippi and the deep south, the states with the highest levels of obesity and diabetes, the message is out there. But again, it used to be in 2000. <clears throat> if you asked a nutritionist to define a healthy diet, it was a low-fat, low-salt diet, maybe with green vegetables. And today, if you ask most nutritionists to define a healthy diet, like the Stanford Diet Fits trial, they had healthy low-carb versus healthy low-fat. And healthy meant no sugar, no refined carbs, no processed foods, no trans fats. So healthy now restricts the carbohydrates that we think are the biggest problem. And I think that's changed dramatically. On the other hand, this is going to be the first time I've ever used an emoji in a talk. <laughs> My friend is always talking about inducing ketosis. What is he talking about? Is that healthy? There's no evidence that such diets are conducive to good health in the long run, and no evidence that they're better than other more sustainable diets, but he's losing weight. Not everything that causes weight loss or apparent metabolic improvement in the short term is a good idea. Cholera, for instance, causes, <laughs> causes weight, blood sugar, and blood lipids to come down. That doesn't mean you want it. Okay, so what's going on? 
I'm going to credit this. Uh, Martin Andre, who's a South African physician working in Van north of Vancouver and Powell River, I think it's called. I was embarrassed when he said this to me because I should have thought about this. I'd been working on this for 20 years. But that's the advantage of talking to all you guys is there's a lot of really intelligent people out there. So the problem is we're prescribing, we're asked to prescribe by hypothesis. So the hypothesis is dietary fat causes heart disease, raises LDL, saturated fat raises LDL cholesterol, it's going to give us premature heart disease, we're going to die prematurely, and a subsection of this is that meat, dietary meat is a problem, either because it has saturated fat in it or because of other problems with eating meat, and so if you eat a meat-rich diet, that's going to kill you prematurely and causes chronic diseases. So we're going to tell you either to eat a low-fat diet or to eat a vegetarian diet or a mostly plant diet, and there are hypotheses. And you have no idea if they're true. I mean, they've been tested poorly, and we've discussed, but you have no idea if they're true for your patients or true for yourself. So if you put somebody on a low-fat diet, you can measure their LDL and see what the response is. You could tell them to avoid butter and eat plant oils, and you could see what happens to their LDL. You have no idea if they'll live a day longer. And if they die at 90, you have no idea if they would have lived to 80 if they had eaten a different diet or if they would have lived to 100 if they had eaten a different diet. God doesn't give us that information. So we're told to prescribe by hypothesis. In the 1960s, as Nina discussed, the American Heart Association bought into this low-fat hypothesis. It was poorly tested then. It failed most of the tests. The evidence is ambiguous. And we firmly believe that that's how we should eat. And we eat by hypothesis. Every time I worry about eating a pad of Kerrygold butter, which I now crave, like, really bizarrely. <laughs> the other hand is this clinical experience thing and this personal experience thing, the Atkins, the conversion narrative, right? You put people on these diets, and they're low in carbs and high in artery-clogging saturated fats, and people appear to get healthier. Everything appears to get better from, you know, epilepsy to obesity to diabetes. They all seem to go into remission in a lot of patients. That's a very powerful phenomenon. And that's what we're up against. So let's talk about these three hypotheses. So one of the interesting things that happened at this British medical journal that I found revelatory was there was a comment made on the second day of the conference by a doctor in the audience who said the audience had been he hijacked by the ketogenic the keto crowd, which, and of course, we were like, you know, one person on a panel here and one person on a panel there, and we were finally getting to get our voices heard, and there were a lot of keto-friendly people in the audience, but from their perspective, it was hijacked. And this is kind of the reason why. So I've been trying to figure this out ever since. This is another observation, which was the single most precise statement of my belief system at this conference was made by Darius Mozaferian, the head of the nutrition department at Tufts and the leading nutritional epidemiologist. And I think Darius is wrong about virtually everything. And he thinks I'm wrong about a lot. I don't know how much. And yet at the conference, he said to someone, obesity, the obesity epidemic, it's not about the calories, it's the sugar and refined grains. Which was like, I, if I had said that, you know, it's shocking. And, 20 years ago, I did say it, and it was shocking, and other people said it, and it's always been shocking. So I was trying to understand why a nutritional epidemiologist could get to that point and yet still be so misguided in so many other things, aside from the fact that he's an epidemiologist, and you guys should know I think about that. So the first problem is energy balance. The first hypothesis is energy balance and its implications. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Um, and this was, there was a talk on obesity given by Mike Lean, ironically. And he's a, in Edinburgh, uh, Scotland, no. Um, anyway, balance between calorie intake and calorie expended determines body weight and body fat changes. Different foods influence total energy consumption by modifying appetite. These are, you know, this is the energy balance hypothesis. So what's interesting about that is if you think about it, it says the way foods influence our weight and the way uh, obesity is caused by taking in more calories than we expend. So that means the difference between pre-obese people, if you imagine two lean individuals, they're both 18 years old. One is going to stay lean his whole life and the other is going to go on to become obese and we could pick you know, a gazillion people that match these two. The difference between them, according to this hypothesis, is nothing physiological. It's that the lean person is going to be able to balance intake and expenditure, and the obese person is not. 
funny, when they're 18 and they're both lean, they're both clearly balancing intake and expenditure, so you can't even see which one is going to fail. You've got nothing that'll predict. So if, we, if I ask the question, and I'm going to run this as a Gadonkin experiment to some of the obesity researchers who still talk to me. Um, if I ask you to predict who's going to get heart disease, we're going to look at lipids, right? And if I ask you who's going to get cerebrovascular disease, we're going to look at blood pressure. And if I ask you who's going to get cancer, we might even look now at insulin and IGF levels. But if I ask you which one of the two is going to get obese, there's no way to tell. They have no predictor, other than that somehow the obese person is going to go on to lose the ability to balance calories. And I'm curious what they'll say, because I... So pre-obese people, i.e. us, at some point in our lives, are equal to lean people minus willpower, they're equal to lean people plus gluttony and sloth, they're the same type of people. So when you walk down the street and you go, I'm going to go to the airport in four hours, I'm going to see people weigh 500 pounds, the difference between them and their 150 pound siblings is that they were out of energy balance. No other difference. Once they get obese, you've got hormonal things, but you can't predict it. So the implication is fascinating. It means a diet for obesity is a healthy diet minus the excess calories, or a healthy diet plus the willpower. Not too much. That's where you get logic like not too much. And my revelation is that this is lean people's diet advice. Right? Again, if you're a lean doctor, or a lean nutritionist, or a lean public health authority, and you are, it works for you. Eating not too much works for you, by definition, because you're lean. Going for runs works for you. Show me a marathon runner and I, who's lean, and I'll show you someone who believes that if everyone ran marathons, they'd be lean too. You know, it's like going to be a chapter in my book saying the best diet device is going to come from formerly fat people. You don't ask lean people for diet advice. They maintain a healthy weight easily. That's what they do, by definition. I mean, now we're changing that. But all the diet advice is lean person diet advice. This is what works for me. This is what I'm going to tell fat people to do. Because I assume that the difference between me and the fat people is they don't do what I do. There's no understanding that there could be a, you know, again, you could have a, I, I mean, if you've got a sibling who's obese, or a parent who's obese, or a student who's obese, I mean, a, any friend who's obese, a colleague who's obese, you know we're fundamentally different. But the conventional wisdom, this calories in, calories out idea, says we're not. That the only difference is how much we eat and exercise. I mean, it's fascinating. And, and this, I would say, I have various role models in life. So when it comes to writing, which I don't like, which is ironic since I'm a writer, my role model, <laughs> my role model is Sisyphus. Um, when I may dedicate my next book to Sisyphus. Um, when it comes to nutrition world, it's clearly Don Quixote, because there's always another windmill to tilt at. And when it comes to the energy balance thing, it's Ahab. It's like, I'm going down, and it's going to end just as badly with me, I'm sure. But <laughs> it is, the implications of this are horrendous. And what it means is, again, a healthy diet. So the, now the question is, what do we define by healthy? And this is where the nutritional epidemiologists come into it, okay? Nutritional epidemiology and its implications. Today's news both low and high carb diets can raise risk of early dust study. Find my friends at the Harvard School of Public Health follow tens of thousands of nurses for 40 years, and lo and behold, the healthiest ones eat fruits, vegetables, legumes, pulses, whole grains. We'll get into that, okay? So what's the problem with this? And it's fascinating. And this was a paper that was written by Darius Mozaferian and Nita Faruhi, who's a nutritional epidemiologist at Cambridge. And... Um, this is what they come out of with these studies. So there are foods that are beneficial and foods that are harmful and foods in the middle. And the healthy people eat the foods that are beneficial. Okay, and to be healthy, the implication is you should eat the foods that are beneficial. So what you think, if you think about what nutritional epidemiology fundamentally does, is it establishes which foods healthy people eat, either a lot of or a little of, and which foods unhealthy people eat, either a little or a lot of, and then it tells, implies that there's a causal relationship, and the healthy people should eat like the unhealthy people. I mean, the unhealthy people should eat like the healthy people. It's like, I don't know if this works. I just came up with this this morning. But it's like we could look at rich people 
And we could do a survey, and we could find out that rich people drive expensive cars, they own expensive watches, they eat at expensive restaurants, they have expensive doctors. And if we tell poor people to buy expensive cars, eat at expensive restaurants, get expensive doctors, et cetera, they'll be rich too. And it doesn't work. Because that's not, so this tells you what healthy people do, doesn't tell you what made them healthy. But the assumption is that this is what made them healthy. So what are the unhealthy people in these surveys? They're the, well, the healthy people are the people without obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and then you compare them to the people with. So the people who are lean compared to the people who are fat, because the assumption, remember, is the only difference is how much they eat and exercise. This shows what they eat and exercise. So this is the hypothesis that comes out of it. Foods that healthy people eat tend to, tend to eat are better for all of us than foods that unhealthy people tend to eat. That's what the nutritional went, but that's how you end up with the paper and the study today. You look at the nurses, follow them for 40 years, lo and behold, the healthy ones and the leaner ones tended to eat healthy carbohydrates, therefore we should all eat healthy carbohydrates. So out of this, you get this kind of logic. Put these two things together. Eat food, not too much is a lean person's thinking, because lean people know they don't eat too much. And mostly plants, because lean people eat mostly plants. Everything in moderation. I want to shoot people who say this. <laughs> okay, lean people eat in moderation. How do we know they eat in moderation? Because they're lean. Okay, they think they eat in moderation because they're lean. Therefore, I mean, there's a few 20 year olds out there who know they're binge eaters and they're still lean, but they're not giving us advice. Okay, my brother, who never got over 195 in his whole life, used to say, he's six foot five, he used to say, I never get. Stuffed, I just get bored of eating after a few hours. Okay? But from his perspective, that's moderation because he's lean. Blue zones. Go around the world, find a lot of really healthy people, find out what they eat, and tell the rest of us to eat just like that under the assumption that that's why they're so healthy. We don't know why they're so healthy any more than we know. We just know that's what they do. Then the vegan, vegetarian, plant based diet movement. It's all the same thing, it's all the same idea. Healthy people tend to eat plant-based diets. Healthy people also tend to have better doctors. They tend to be higher socioeconomic status. They tend to cook more for themselves. They tend to avoid fast food restaurants because they know they're unhealthy. They tend to be health conscious. They tend to exercise. They tend to smoke less. They tend to do a lot of things. They own better cars. They live in better areas. They're not as a, you know, they're not, it's, okay. okay. <laughs> What about for those of us who do have metabolic syndrome, obesity, and diabetes? You put these two things together, you get the same healthy foods, but less of them. And in Zurich, we got to hear a presentation from the people who did the direct diabetes remission clinical trial. So you start off with a kind of healthy-ish diet, and then you get them to eat less of it, and they lose weight. And then you put them on a maintenance diet, which is less of it. It's two-thirds, and you expect them to stay on less of it for their whole life, because by all these hypotheses, lean, you know, people are overweight, obese, diabetic, should eat healthy foods, but less of them, because the problem is they eat too much of them. Here's the irony, okay? Who needs diet and nutrition advice? Healthy people don't need it. We need it the people who are obese, who are not lean and not healthy. And the problem is we are not the same as they are. Our obese and diabetic patients are not the same as our lean people, patients, and we have no idea if they could tolerate the same foods. I like to think of it as the insulin resistance hyperinsulinemia phenotype. You know, what we're seeing worldwide is a explosive manifestation in genetic terms. Doesn't matter what the underlying genotype is. This is why I think it's relatively simple. You see an explosive manifestation of the obese or diabetic, this insulin-resistant hyperinsulinemia phenotype. And then the question is, how do you deal with them? Because what we're assuming is they're identical to the lean people, and they're identical to the healthy people, except they eat too much, and they're not. So the healthiest diet for this phenotype, now we're getting into the conflict. This is the alternative hypothesis. That's a diet in which our phenotype does not manifest itself. So it puts obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, et cetera, ep childhood epilepsy into remission. We talk about now, should we talk about you know, diabetes reversal or diabetes remission? I think we should also talk about obesity reversal and obesity remission, it's the same thing. And from us, for those of us who 
manifest this phenotype. I don't care what people manifest a different phenotype is because we have different, we're responding to environmental triggers differently. So for us, the diet which puts our phenotype into remission is probably the healthiest diet. Again, you, the, God makes no promises that it won't kill us prematurely through some bizarre fluke that we can't imagine. There's always unintended consequences. So I'm going to assume that that's a diet that minimizes insulin secretion. And this is a chart I was glad Steve Finney showed. You showed a version of this in Zurich, and I hadn't seen you use this before. But to me, this is the most important chart in this business. This was a study done by Ralph DeFranzo's group at uh, UT uh, Southwestern back in 1990 or so, and it looked at um, insulin resistance, insulin uh, levels versus fatty acid mobilization, oxidation, and, is in, and this was young, healthy students, so it's assuredly worse in the rest of us. But as insulin levels come down, fatty acid uh, turnover basically stays the same, because the insulin, and, and the researchers would talk about uh, adipocytes, fat tissue being exquisitely sensitive to insulin. So as long as there's a little bit of insulin, your fat tissue is still gonna hold on the hormone-sensitive lipase, particularly, is going to respond to that insulin, and it's not going to break down triglycerides into fatty acids. And then you get to some low level, and boom. It's like a switch is flicked, and to use a Gladwell-esque term, you lose weight as if by magic. Um, you know, don't know where that number is. I mean, it's assuredly different for everyone, and it's probably different at different times of day. Um, but what it tells you is you got to get below that threshold to have meaningful uh, fatty acid, to get the fat out of your fat tissue and mobilize it. Um, this is uh, Belladon. This is still um, how um, uh, Ralph DeFranzo and company phrased it. So and from the clinical and anecdotal observation, those of us who keep our insulin resistance, our hyperinsulinemia in remission by diet, so stay healthy, do so by minimizing insulin secretion and, in effect, maximizing the time we spend below that threshold. So what we eat is something very different than what healthy people eat. And this is the problem. So, you know, we'll eat nuts and fish and green vegetables, but we don't tend to eat fruits and vegetable oils and whole grains and beans, and we probably stay away from milk. And then there are other things under the harm level that we both do. And these foods in particular, if you're a nutritional epidemiologist, you believe these foods are necessary for a healthy diet because that's what lean, healthy people eat. But for us, they're not, okay? So what we're told to eat to be healthy is to add good foods to our diet. That's, that's the nature of this conflict. That's the nature of the conflict, the article we just had uh, published today in The Lancet, okay? Look at what healthy people eat. They eat some carbohydrates. 40% carbs. Well, they eat some carbs because they can tolerate those carbs. Doesn't mean they wouldn't be healthier if they didn't eat them, because those studies tell us nothing about causality. So this is a conflict, and this is a perspective, ultimately. You've got I, I, insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemic phenotype. What we feel we eat, what we put our patients on and they eat, what makes people healthy versus what healthy people think they should eat, because they're healthy already. Okay, and this is how, what they believe. So this is just, I was looking at the textbook of obesity. All diets that result in weight loss do so on one basis and one basis only. They reduce total calorie intake. That's the conventional wisdom. And this is what we believe, our alternative, I would call this the fad textbook of obesity. All diets that result in weight loss do so on one basis and one basis only. They reduce total carbohydrate intake or improve the quality of the carbohydrates consumed, or they lower insulin and keep it low, basically. And then all of what we eat, I mean, the way I'm thinking about this, this could be right, it could be wrong, but I think most of the, 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 the more time you spend below the threshold, so if something helps you spend more time below that threshold, whether it's carnivory or intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding and we could discuss you know, that for hours. You know, the greater time you spend below the threshold, the leaner and healthier you'll tend to be. And so when you're dealing with you physicians dealing with patients, it's like, let's get them below the threshold and let's keep them below the threshold. How am I doing for time, Steve? Four minutes? 
Okay, because this is just stopped at one. Okay. <laughs> okay, so just get to some of the things I learned from talking to physicians. And this is, you know, the key to success with patients, with individuals, that belief is commitment, because you got to get behind below that threshold. If that's the way to think about it, getting below that threshold is not e it's easy for some people. And it's not easy for others, and we have no idea. You know, the only way you know, which is kind of tautological, is you're losing weight or your diabetes numbers at least have increased. Um, commitment can be a two-way sword because, of course, if somebody isn't getting better, you assume they're not committing. So you might be doing yourself or your patients uh, injustice. Um, Eric Westman gets an enormous amount of credit. I was thinking when I started this, again, the people really pushing this would made allowed me to come to a different conclusion in my famous What If It's All Been a Big Fat Lie article to Malcolm Gladwell was I didn't read the zone, so I wasn't smelling snake oil everywhere, and I got a chance to talk to people like Eric Westman and Steve Finney and Jeff Folak, who had started doing studies and started doing research and gave this some academic credit and credibility. So Eric's line is, and Eric's probably treated more patients than anyone alive, and he's as responsible for spreading this from his single node and duke as anyone alive. And he said, if you do this, it'll work, but I can't make you do it. And the word on the street is, I'm too strict, but maybe strict is the answer. And one of the problems, I, the conflicts I had talking to physicians is how do you get people, they didn't necessarily think about this, but how do you get people low enough in carbs to get them underneath the threshold? Do you walk them down slowly because they don't want to give up their carbohydrates? Do you sue over shaking her head no? Um, which could be true, or do you just throw them in the deep end and they'll be unhappy for two or three days max and then it'll work. And if, but if you don't get them below, you'll never know. And this is one of the interesting, I was recently at a conference where I was sitting next to a young woman who had been in the low carb arm of uh, uh, Christopher Gardner's latest study at Stanford, the one my not-for-profit help study. So this was a, it was supposed to be a very low-carb intervention close to a ketogenic diet, and she weighed 240 when she started. She now works for a, a big accounting firm, and she showed me, she charted everything, and she showed me the graph, and she lost 30 pounds in the first three months. And then, at Stanford urging, she added some carbs back, some berries. She missed berries. They didn't want anyone to drop out of the trial. So if you miss something, add it back. She lost five pounds in the next three months, at which point at Stanford urging, she added more fruit back and never lost another pound. So what I said to her as gently as I could, if you hadn't, I know you missed the berries, but if you hadn't added the berries back and you hadn't added the fruit back, you might weigh 140 now instead of 220. And at 140, A, you might not have missed them anymore because your body's burning fat efficiently, so you're craving butter like I am. <laughs> and B, it might be worth the trade-off. But if you don't fully commit and stay fully commit, I was stunned when I saw 30 pounds of weight loss in three months is unbelievable, and I'm sure this, and then, and with, without being hungry, without all the things we know, and then it, as soon as she added back berries, it tapered off. In my research, Pennington, who pioneered this work in the 50s at DuPont, said he had a single, he had a DuPont executive who lost 50 pounds effortlessly, but if he ate a single apple, the weight loss stopped. I'm wondering if he ate the single apple after a workout, would that have been cool? <laughs> Jeff says no. Okay. I did ask everyone about ketosis. How much do you care about ketosis? Is it vitally important? And from the physician's point of view, it was, if the patient is losing weight, let's not complicate anything. They talked about patients who would get obsessed with whether or not they were in ketosis and kind of lose sight and, you know, jack up their fat consumption by 1,000 calories a day, maybe therefore, uh, you know, getting into ketosis while inhibiting weight loss. So there were a lot of issues. But the only time, really, of these physicians, it's if the weight loss was plateauing or they weren't seeing the improvements they expected in lipids and blood sugar control, then they would talk about, you know, use ketosis nuts as anything as a way to, another way to check compliance. And then they said they're always like engineering types who just, you know, they love this shit, so <laughs> go with it. Um, so these were, you know, issues about plateaus, and if you're paid, you know, and again, there's nothing, I just wanted to get a feel for these problems, and it was interesting how there were different perspectives all the way around, and it was hard to judge which were more informed and which were, because a lot of these only had 10 patients, some had thousands of patients. So poor compliance was obviously a possibility, and 
you know, the people who said, look, they, I have patients swear that they're just completely following a low carb diet, and then you go out to lunch and they're, you know, they're eating a cinnamon bun and, and, and you know, BLT. So they think they're doing it because they're eating bacon. Um, <laughs> Some of these physicians said, I get them, they're not eating enough fat, and I have them add fat, and some said they're eating too much fat, and I have to get them to subtract fat. I mean, apparently there are people who think that, and I've met them, where they think if they're not doing bulletproof coffees twice a day, they're not doing a ketogenic diet. And so this could, you know, inhibit weight loss conceivably. We don't know. Um, too little protein. Most people, you know, kind of prescribe to what we prescribe that protein is too much protein is going to kick people out of ketosis and raise insulin and inhibit fat loss. But there are people out there who think that you can't give them too much protein, and the problem is they're not getting enough. And then maybe it just doesn't work for weight. It should work for all the other manifestations of insulin resistance. Um, who complies and still fails? I went through all of this. The insulin sensitive, possibly. Older women, possibly. I got both opinions. Um, alcohol drinkers, clearly. Um, <laughs> and I heard this over and over again. It's like, you know, if I think he's on a ketogenic diet and he has four beers every night or four glasses of wine every night, and if I can get him off the wine, I can you know, fix them. Uh, just some messages, things I had heard from these people. I'm just, I, Kim Connolly's a, a dietitian in Australia, and when her patients come in, she just said, look, what you're doing is failing. Let's just try something completely different. Just suspend disbelief, suspend everything. We're going to try something completely different. Buy into it, because what you're doing is clearly failing. Um, Peter Foley, the idea about exercise being important, and you know, think about the 84 meals a month you're eating, that's a little more important than the you know, 12 workouts. Um, Brian Sab was stuck, not about changing behavior because we eat the wrong stuff, it's about changing physiology so what we crave and want to eat is different. And again, this is one of the things, if you could get you know, keto adapted, if you can get them under the threshold, they will become fat burners, and then they will become fat cravers. And, um, you know, then what you want to eat, in theory, is making you healthy. In theory is a key word. Um, I love this. Even if they fall off the wagon, at least they know there's now a wagon to get back on, because we all, you know, it's this idea, and you heard it all the time, and we're finally getting past this, that, oh, yeah, I lost 60 pounds on Atkins, but then it stopped working. And you say, well, what do you mean, did you gain it back, and they said, no, I just went back to eating carbs. <laughs> and that's the old way to think about diets. It was you do it until you lose the weight, and then you go back to eating the way you used to, maybe trying to do not to the not too much thing, and you gain the weight back. Um, I love this. Evelyn, I can give you pills or I can teach you how to eat. That's what she would tell her patients. And since most of these patients, if they don't at the moment have something that needs medication, they are going to. And here's also, um, many diabetic patients tell me they can't go low carb because they love pasta and bread too much. I say, imagine if you were allergic to almonds and could eat them, but only with an EpiPen, would you? <laughs> they say, of course not. So why eat pasta when you can eat them only with an insulin shot? And this is the 1963 version by Blake Donaldson. This was my favorite line. Blake began prescribing a low-carb diet in 1919 in New York and did it. He actually influenced Pennington, who influenced Taller, who influenced Atkins. And he said, you're out of your mind when you take insulin in order to eat a Danish. Um, Sue, who's in the audience, who is going to get a prominent place in every book I write from here on in, except maybe if it's not about nutrition. Um, Weight loss is a learned skill. Even people who have great effort in the beginning often don't put the time and effort into learning the skill. I ask patients, do you play the guitar? They say no. And if somebody asks you to play a guitar, could you do it? They say no, I'd have to practice. It's just like any other learned skill, you have to practice to be good at it. And it's funny, we think about practicing cooking to be good at it. And we, think, we never think about practicing eating to be good at it. And we didn't have to practice eating to be good at it because up until 150 years ago, we didn't have any foods we could eat that were particularly, I mean, they'd either kill you quickly, but they weren't chronic disease driving. Now we have a world full of it, and we have to, it's a learned skill, and you have to teach people. We all have to learn it, and we learn it as we go along. This was from a mother of an obese child that um, I didn't ask for permission. One minute. Is that with questions or without? 
No questions. So when your players scoring points, you never pull them out of the game. Okay, I got about three more slides. She said, you have to learn to choose your words carefully. If you say we do a low-carb diet, it's seen as this horrific forbidden thing. If you say we eat vegetables and meats and healthy fats, the response is, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> it's like 10, a year ago, I started time-restricted feeding. If I tell people I don't eat breakfast anymore, nobody cares. If I say I'm doing time-restricted feeding, I am a food faddist. Um, I thought it was a fad, by the way, and I thought it was going to pass, and I, I'm sold. Um, this was something Mike Eads, who might have been the first uh, physician to really nail the insulin glucagon thing, did it in Thin So Fast, which is a pre-protein-powered diet book. And in the last chapter, he talked about discipline as an art form. And I really think it, everyone should read this, because really, it was really meaningful. And he said, you may not be able to control anything else, but you can control your eating. You must recognize that you have complete control of your progress on this diet. If you seize control and follow the dietary guidelines, his dietary guidelines, <laughs> you'll be successful. If you don't, you won't. And we don't, again, we've never really thought about diets like this. And people will say, you know, I can't do this because I love my bagels. It's like the one thing you can control. And now it's our health. It's not just 20 extra pounds and bikini season. We're talking about serious health issues. Um, so I'm going to end with it. Well, I'll go, I, you can't be all good advice. It's not all hearts and rainbows. Some people do struggle like crazy. And then Nick Miller, who's a dentist, said, you don't get cake and ice cream when it's over. <laughs> and this is my last message. This, to me, the ultimate challenge is like, you know, we could blame the nutrition community. We can blame the establishment. We know how they think. We know why they think. We know why this institutional dogma is so powerful. We know how much trouble they're going to have backing out of it. It's always our job to communicate better. If they don't get it, we're the ones who are still failing. And luckily, these diets are so damn effective. This way of eating is so damn effective that it's not going away and that it's almost assuredly we're going to win. But, you know, we have to communicate better. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you.